Last time on search algorithms, we took a look at linear search. Now, this was a very intuitive algorithm, but it was unfortunately also rather slow. Today, we're going to take a look at a method that doesn't need to look at every item in a list in order to find something. I know it sounds mysterious, but that is exactly what we're going to do. You're watching episode 2 of Search Algorithms, Binary Search. Hello and welcome to Search Algorithms. Today, we're going to actually explore an algorithm that, by making one assumption, is able to search through a list of items much, much quicker. This method is called binary search, and the prerequisite required for this algorithm to work in the first place is that the input list must be sorted. So we'll take parallels from our sorting algorithm series here. You can of course sort a list in any way, but we are just going to start off with an already sorted list, and we're going to try and perform binary search on this list. So okay, we have a sorted list. How do we actually search for an item in it quickly? You see, by taking advantage of the fact that things are sorted, what you can do is you can look at a particular item and you can decide whether it's larger or smaller than the item you're looking for. So essentially, you're playing a game of hot and cold with your input list, and that is actually enough to help you home in on the item you're looking for. So without further ado, let us go ahead and actually trace this algorithm. So let's start off simple, we're going to have a list of 1 to 10, and let's say we're looking for the number 6. What we're going to do is we're going to half the entire list and we're going to look at that item that is smack dab in the center. Now, since this is a list of 10 items, it is an even sized list. There isn't actually a middle element. Or if you want to look at this from a different perspective, you could say this list has two middle values and just as a convention, we'll pick the item on the left. There is nothing wrong with picking the item on the right. You just have to do it the same way every time you encounter a similar problem. So alright, now we are actually looking at the number 5. The number we want to look for is actually 6, and as a result, 5 is too small. Now, if 5 is too small and the list is sorted, obviously everything to the left of 5, and of course including 5 itself, is definitely too small. And as a result, there's half the list we can actually ignore. Yes, our algorithm doesn't ever need to go to that part of the list again, because since the list is sorted, we are obviously not going to find number 6 anywhere within that range. So essentially what's happening here is we're left with the rightmost half of the list. This process actually happens over, and will happen as many times as required for us to home in on the one item we're looking for. So 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, the middle value is 8. Now 8 is obviously bigger than 6, and as a result, 8, 9, and 10 are discarded from the list. As you can see by doing just two comparisons, we've discarded 8 out of 10 items, and there are only two possibilities left. To follow our convention of picking the leftmost item when we're looking in a list, what's going to happen is we're going to look at 6 and realize, hey, that's the number we're looking for. And so the algorithm happily says, oh, there it is, and it might give the user a position for where the number 6 is, and terminates. That's it. And in a nutshell, that is a trace for the successful condition. Let's now go ahead and look at what happens when the number we're looking for is actually missing. So here's a list, pretty much almost the same as what we've had previously, but now with the number 6 removed. We're still going to try and look for the number 6, except now of course, the algorithm will not find it. So the middle item at this point is 5, and we say that 5 is too small, and we discard the left half of the list. We divide the remainder of the list up, and we look at 8. We decide that 8 is too large, and as a result, we throw away 8, 9, and 10. So we're left with 7, we look at it and we say, hey, that's too large too, and we discard it. You realize that there are actually no items left in the list that you haven't discarded, and what that clearly tells you is that the item you're looking for isn't in the list. Now, practically, when we actually implement binary search in order to find out what is still relevant and what is discarded, what we have are left and right pointers. The two pointers start off at the extremities of the entire array, and to find the middle item, we just take the position of the right pointer minus the position of the left pointer and divide that value by 2. Now do note that when this formula produces a number with a decimal point, all you have to do is to round it down. After using the middle item to perform a comparison, either one of the left or right pointers must be moved inwards. 
to reflect how part of the list has been discarded. For example, if the middle item is too small, we move the left pointer in, one position right of the middle item. Similarly, if the middle item was too large, we move the right pointer in, one position left of the middle item. Rinse and repeat, you'll see that the two pointers keep coming in towards each other, and eventually, they either converge on an item or overshoot, and that will either tell you that the item is there, and that is the item selected, or the item is missing. So then the question is, how fast is binary search? Well, binary search is all log n. That's right, in a list of n items, you only need to look at a very small proportion of the items there to actually find what you're looking for. However, there is a catch, and that is, the input list must be sorted. If it isn't, you cannot do binary search. Now, if you insist on using binary search on an unsorted list, you're going to have to sort it first. But notice what happens to the time complexity. The fastest comparison sorting algorithm takes O and log n time. So if you were to actually take in an input list, sort it, and then do binary search, essentially what you're doing is having first an O and log n operation occur, that is of course the sorting, and then an O log n process occur, that is the binary search. The total time required is n log n plus log n, and as a result, the entire operation becomes an O and log n operation. And that, in fact, is slower than just doing a linear search. So what this means is if you're given an unsorted list, you'd rather do a linear search, because sorting first and then using binary search is going to take more time. Now, for those of you who have actually watched Sorting Algorithms++, Plus Plus, and that is a series that I just wrapped up maybe two weeks ago, you realize I covered this data structure called the binary search tree. If you are interested to find out more about that, you can actually click on the annotation on screen right now and go over to watch the episode on binary search trees. You might also want to take a look at balanced binary search trees because that is what works best. I mention this because, well, the binary search tree actually has a very interesting property that can help us in searching. First and foremost, notice that a binary search tree is almost sorted in the sense that if you read it out in a correct way, namely using in-order traversal, you will actually get a sorted list. You notice that when you're actually searching for an item in a balanced binary search tree, you are doing pretty much the same thing as a binary search. At every node you are on, when you decide whether you want to go left or whether you want to go right, and you go down one path, you are essentially throwing away half the tree. Every single step you take moving down, discards half a subtree of nodes. So in fact, the binary search tree is a data structure that innately makes use of binary search. Unfortunately, this also does not provide any performance improvement, seeing as that if you want to insert n item, it takes log n time. And if you want to insert n items, it'll take n log n time. So at the end of the day, if you take the tree construction into account, searching for something using a binary search tree still takes n log n time. But anyway, there you have it. Today we covered binary search, as well as an actual practical implementation of binary search in a data structure. We also took a very in-depth look at the time complexity of search algorithms, in a sense that the actual searching step might be fast, but there might be other overheads that we cannot neglect, and these might come from the actual sorting of a list or constructing a data structure for us to perform binary search on. Anyway, that's all there is for this episode of Search Algorithms. If you have any comments, queries, or suggestions, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. Don't forget to check out the official Twitter account for this channel at twitter.com slash 0612TV. As always, I appreciate every like, favorite, and subscription you give me. But until next time, you're watching 0612TV.